This is the beginning of our study of a subject in mathematics called graph theory. I'm going to tell you in this lecture some of the basic concepts of graph theory and give you a few simple examples. So let's get started. In mathematics, a graph consists of vertices and edges. Let me tell you right away that the singular of the word vertices is a vertex, so we say one vertex, two vertices, three vertices, and so on. And vertices are just points. You should just think they're points. When we draw them, we draw them rather thickened so that we can see them on our piece of paper. Anyway, those are vertices. Going over to edges, an edge is simply a way of connecting two vertices. Or sometimes, as we'll see, it connects a vertex to itself. When we draw an edge, we draw it however we find it to be convenient, typically as a line segment, sometimes as an arc, or some other kind of a curve. Let's look at some examples. All right, here are three examples of graphs. The example on the left looks like a square with the diagonals drawn in. You can see that I've drawn four vertices there. And if you'll count them, you'll see there are six edges. The one in the middle is an example of something that we'll later call a complete bigraph. It has six vertices, two on the left, four on the right, and it has eight edges if you count them. The one on the right actually has a name, although you won't be expected to remember. This is called the Peterson graph. It's a certain graph that has 10 vertices and 15 edges. Now, one thing I want to emphasize is that when you draw a graph, or when we think about a graph, the placement of the vertices and the edges doesn't matter. The only thing that matters about an edge is which pair of vertices it connects. So, for example, here are two drawings of the same graph, which are obtained simply by taking one of those vertices, the one that's over on the left in the picture, and moving it to another position and dragging the edges along. Just to illustrate this a little bit further, I'm going to show you a little game on the internet. So here's that game. The game is called Planarity, and if you want to play it, you can go to the website that's listed up above, which is www.planarity.net and launch a game. And as you can see, it's a little game that involves working with a graph. And the whole point of the game is simply to move the vertices around. The edges will come along for the ride. And what you're trying to do is to try to make a drawing of the graph in which none of the vertices are crossing over each other. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is I want to emphasize that as I'm doing this, I'm really not changing the graph. It's always the same graph. We're just drawing it in a different way as we move the vertices around. And this graph happens to be what's called a planar graph. As you can see, while explaining it, I've also been playing the game and I've managed to win because now I've drawn it so that none of the edges cross each other in the drawing. And that's a nice thing to do. It makes the, the drawing rather more clear than it was to begin with. On the other hand, there's really no need to do this in graph theory. If you want to draw your graphs with edges crossing, you can do that. And also, actually, it's not always possible to do this. Not every graph can be drawn this way. Now, people in mathematics really do make use of graphs. In fact, if you go over to the math tower on the Ohio State campus, which is where the math department is located, you'll see that out front of the building we actually have some decorative tiles, and on those tiles are drawings of graphs. For example, there's the Peterson graph, if you can see it. Uh, a little bit closer is one, the name is cut off, that happens to be the Kuratowski graph. You'll notice that in these drawings, um, the vertices aren't really drawn in a thickened way, although it should be obvious where they are. For example, in the Kuratowski graph, there are five vertices. Also notice that the edges have been drawn as if they cross over and under each other. That's sometimes a good idea for clarity in a drawing, and it emphasizes the fact that where those 
edges seem to be crossing is just meaningless. It doesn't mean anything in terms of the idea of the graph itself. Let's look at some other basic concepts in this subject. The number of edges coming into a vertex is called the degree of the vertex. Now to illustrate this, I'm going to go back to uh, one of the previous examples. Let's look at the, the graph over here and let's look at this vertex right there that I've just circled. We can see that has degree 3, right? If we look at that vertex, we see that three edges are coming in. If we look at this vertex in this graph, we see that that is a vertex of degree 4. This one that I'm now circling is a vertex of degree 2. If you look over at the Peterson graph, which is the graph over here on the right, you can see actually each vertex in this graph has degree 3. It's also possible to have degree 0 in a graph. Let me just draw you very quickly an example of a, of a graph with a, a vertex of degree uh, 0. So let me draw some vertices. These are being drawn very crudely. Put in some edges here. Now I want to think that this is a single graph. Okay, I haven't drawn two graphs here. That's one single graph with four vertices. And what's the degree of the vertex on the left? Well, it's degree zero. Now, you may wonder why would anybody want to do that, but in fact it is allowed. We allow a vertex to have degree zero. By the way, don't use the phrase number of degrees. That's just redundant. A degree by definition is a number. So we don't look at a vertex and say the number of degrees is 5. We simply say this vertex has degree 5. Here are some more basic concepts. A path is a sequence of distinct edges you can follow through the graph. And the number of edges in the path is called the length of the path. Again, let me go back to some of the previous examples to illustrate this. Let's take the uh, graph over on the left again. And let's say we want to define a path here. Well, to have, we have to first of all say where we would start. And I'm lettering this in a very crude way, but there's our starting vertex. Okay, now we can go wherever we like, but let's say we go like this that uses an edge, then we could go along this edge here, and we could go along this edge, and we could follow this edge. So I've just described a path consisting of four edges. It starts at the top left vertex, you take this edge to the top right, you take this edge to go down, you take this edge to go left, and then you take this edge, and this is your ending vertex for that path. That is a path of length 4. Notice that I didn't repeat using any edge. That's part of the condition when you're specifying a path. You're not supposed to repeat edges. Now, if for each pair of vertices you can find a path between them, then the graph is said to be connected and otherwise it's disconnected. Well, to illustrate this, again let me go back to those examples. You can look at this picture and you can think, well, this is a picture of three distinct graphs. There's a graph on the left, there's a graph in the middle, there's a graph on the right. Or I could say to you, no, I want you to think that this is a single graph. This is a single graph having as many vertices as it does. Well, let's see, 4 plus 6 plus 10, that's 20 vertices and all the edges that are shown, but now it's a disconnected graph because you see, for example, there's certainly not any path going from this vertex to this vertex, right? There's just no sequence of edges I could possibly follow and get over there, and that's pretty obvious. There are no edges that are going to get you from here over to here. These, by the way, are said to be the components or the path components of the graph.
Okay, so some graphs are connected and some are disconnected. Something else that we may allow is loops. We haven't talked about that yet, but let me draw you an example of a loop. Suppose here's a vertex. Let me draw a couple of others too, just so that we have an interesting picture. And now here is a loop. Okay, that's a single edge that connects the vertex to itself. Okay, now obviously we can't draw that one as a line segment. We have to make it loop around, hence the name. This is connecting the vertex to itself. By the way, you may now begin to wonder, well now when we're counting degrees, how do we count the degree of this vertex right here? Right, there's obviously an edge coming out here and an edge coming out here. But what about this one? Do we count this once or do we count it twice? And the convention is we count it twice. In fact, that's kind of nice. That means that you don't even need to know anything except this very local picture. If you look here at what I've just circled, you can see that this vertex has four edges coming out from it. We say that this vertex has degree four. Okay, degree four. Another thing that we may allow in a graph, depending on the purposes to which we're putting it, is we may allow multiple edges. So here's an edge, and here's another one, and here's a third one, okay? So here we have two vertices connected by three edges. We sometimes allow that depending on the circumstances. And finally, something else that we may want when we're working in graph theory is we may want what are called directed edges. So here's an edge. A directed edge simply means making it into an arrow to indicate which way it goes. So now we think, oh, here's an edge that starts here and ends here. It's a directed edge. Now, why would one want to study graph theory? I'm going to let this person answer the question. This is Maria Chudnowski, who is a mathematician at Columbia University in New York, and she works in the area of mathematics called graph theory. People actually do study this for a living. They can make that their research specialty. Um, she won a MacArthur Genius Grant not long ago, and from the description of her work, let's read what they had to say. In mathematics, a graph is an abstraction that represents a set of similar things and the connections between them. For example, cities and the roads connecting them, or networks of friendship among people, websites and their links to other sites. Let me show you some examples of this sort of thing. In fact, I'll just conclude with one example now and we'll see others later on. This is a graph which explains the rules for a game which is called Rock, Paper, Scissors, Lizard, Spock. I suspect that you have all played the game called Rock, Paper, and Scissors. And in this game, if you happen not to know, which I would be very surprised, the two players say one, two, three, and then they put out their hands and they make a gesture with their hands. And depending on what gestures they have made, one of them is declared to be the winner. So for example, as I think everybody knows, if one person is showing this, which is called scissors, and the other person is showing this, they've just put their hand flat, this is called paper, and scissors beats paper. Now that's all indicated in this graph. These are vertices which have been drawn very large and actually the pictures are then shown inside. And here is an edge, in fact it's a directed edge, going from scissors to paper. And the direction of the arrow indicates which one is the winner, right? We're, we're drawing the arrows that go from the winner to the loser in every case. So one can say what the rules are in the game Rock, Paper, Scissors, or in this larger game called Rock, Paper, Scissors, Lizard, Spock, by stating them all in sentences, but you see it actually becomes much clearer if you just make a graph. This directed graph shows you all the possibilities. There are five vertices because there are five possible gestures, and then there are ten edges showing all the possible pairs 
of gestures that might be made and indicating which one is, is the winner. So let's do one other example. Here's Spock over here. This is the Spock gesture shown in bl the blue vertex. And here is Lizard, which is shown in green. And in fact, Lizard can bite Spock and poison him. And therefore, we say that Lizard beats Spock. And that's simply shown by the direction of this green arrow. Okay, so everything you need to know about the, how the game is played is shown here. Uh, by the way, as I think you all know, if two people show the same gesture, then that's a tie. To finish up here, let me briefly mention an example that you're going to be working on in your recitation. And this is an example which is based on a problem about using the subway system in New York City. In the graph that you're going to draw in the recitation, the vertices will represent certain subway stations. And then the edge between two vertices will mean that you can get on a train at one station and get off the train at the other station. Thus, if I'm given a pair of stations, there either will or will not be an edge between them, and it's simply determined as follows. If you can take a train from one station to the other, a single train, then there will be an edge drawn, and otherwise there won't. 